Let's open in a word of prayer and then make our adieu into our text, asking the Lord to help us get centered into our word. I hope you have your outline from last time. Uh, there may be some extra outlines up there. I don't know. It's kind of, huh? You're making some? Okay. All right. So I'll open in prayer. If you got your Bibles, you can follow me along. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this opportunity to enter into your word, study your precepts. We ask that as we do, that you would grant us access into your presence by your spirit, by settling our hearts and our minds, by focusing our thoughts on your word, by opening our understanding and then inclining our affections towards the gospel truth that uh, your word so clearly lays out for those to whom you have revealed your covenant to. We again thank you for this study in the Psalms for all those who have been committed to uh, a working through the Psalms for this summer. Bless them, Lord, with the reality of those blessings with which the psalmist himself, themselves, have experienced your mercy and your kindness and grace. And, uh, and allow us, Lord, to, as a consequence of being blessed, be a blessing to others. So we come to you first and foremost uh, with the asking of the forgiveness of our sins and the purging of our conscience and the washing of our hearts. We cannot enter into your presence to any benefit except we acknowledge that we are sinful sinners inclined to sin, needing the redemption that comes through Christ and through Christ alone. And by faith we receive it and now we wait for your spirit to work in our understanding those things which only you can do. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in Psalms 26. Um, you, um, let me see here. We started off at verse 1 because I really did want to make uh, a, a clear introduction and foundation towards the nature of this psalm. In verse 1 of Psalm 26, where David says, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, and therefore shall, therefore shall, and therefore I shall not slide. And then he said in verse two, "Examine me, O Lord, and prove me, and try my heart, or my reins, or my thoughts, and then my inner man, because your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in thy truth." <clears throat> Those three verses we began to look at last week, we actually made a. Uh, quite a bit of headway through them, and if you have your outline in front of you, you will mark what the first point underscores, and that is we want God's judgment of ourselves, we want to be judged in Christ, and then we also want to see Christ as our judgment. Um, all three verses co correspond to those statements relative to a gospel lens or prism by which we interpret the whole Bible. Last week we made two observations that I think are critical to our um, assessment of what David is requesting, and that is God is the judge, right? And it's important for us to know that um, if we misrepresent God's essential character, then we misrepresent the gospel and we misrepresent uh, man's need of God. God is judge and God is judge of all of humanity and God judges mankind both in time and eternity and therefore because he is judge, believers who know God in a saving way deal with God in terms of him being our judge and as uh, it might seem to be an uncomfortable thing with you, to deal with God in terms of judge, you have to. You have to just know that God judges. And we learned last week that God judges the righteous and God judges the wicked. God judges everyone. There's a sense in which God sits on this throne and he judges all things that are taking place. And I'm sure you are aware of that as well. That's an uncomfortable concept for mankind for which humanity would completely divest themselves of God's existence if they could because they do not want a God judging them for who they are or their behavior. But what's remarkable about the Psalms that we have been working through is that David wants God to judge him. So we take that second observation. First, God is judged. Secondly, the believer wants God to judge him. 
And the reason why we want God to judge us is because we know God. We know God. First of all, he's going to judge us anyway. But we want God to judge us because we know God as a God of righteousness and a God of mercy. And because we know him as a God of righteousness and a God of mercy, we must appeal to the God who will judge right. And in his righteous judgment, he has a solution to our problems. The other thing that we acquired as we looked at David's observation of this is that this was not the first time that David rendered this request. Judge me, O Lord. I share it with you throughout the whole of the Psalms. You will find David pleading with God to be his judge, to be the one who actually assesses David's heart, to be the one who makes a final decision and determination as to David's motives and actions. This is something that goes on all throughout David's engagement with God on this matter of judgment. We looked at this, and if you will, go back to Psalm uh, chapter 7, and we saw this as well in Psalm 7, a fundamental truth, and we'll look at a few more verses around this. In Psalm 7, this is what David says as he speaks to this matter of judgment, Psalm 7, verse 8. The Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to, what did we learn last week? My righteousness and according to my integrity that is in me. And we saw in a latter psalm that David made the same request. Lord, judge me, but this time not according to my righteousness, but according to your righteousness. So J David is not only asking God to judge him, he's asking God to judge him according to righteousness, according to God's righteousness. And we examine that thoroughly and we realize that David was saying to God, you be the one to determine my standing before you. If I am guilty, if I am, if I am sinful, and if I am wicked in your eyes, then you exercise the judgment that is just against me. But I trust you, O oh God, that your judgment of me will work out towards my salvation. And this is where back at verse 1 of chapter 26 that we are at, where David begins to uh, sort of explain to us why it is that he will be confident that God's judging him will work out to his benefit. He says, judge me, O oh Lord, for I have walked in my what? Integrity. Remember what we learned integrity meant last week. It meant to be perfect. It meant to be innocent. The idea of uh, being uh, a person that walks in integrity, it means to be a person who walks in maturity. And I shared with you last week that that word is also translated perfect as is given to us in the book of Job, chapter one, verse one, and verse eight, where Job becomes for us a whole picture scenario of God's judging the righteous one and at the end of that judgment, the righteous one comes out completely vindicated by God. So the whole book of Job teaches us how that God is judge, that God judges righteously, and that God judges his people righteously, and that the final outcome of God judging his people righteously is that they are righteous. And this is a profound mystery, but only believers in Christ can understand this. That when God judges the believer, he judges the believer in Christ. And in judging the believer in Christ, the believer finds confidence that when God finishes judging him, he will not only be found to be righteous, but he will have been vindicated from all other judgments that are imposed upon him by those who would attempt to be his judge as well. And so Psalms 26 verse 1 says, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not what? Slip. And so again, David is, uh, he's affirming to God that as he comes into his presence, he's coming into the presence of God, not on the grounds of his own righteousness, but on the grounds of Christ's righteousness, and therefore he will be confident that God's judgment will be one of vindication. We talked about that at length, didn't we? And we talked about how God gave David the insight to understand and to be aware of the fact that he has a mediator between him and God.
that allows for David to be bold enough to stand before God. Here's what he says in verse 2. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me, and try my reins in my heart. Again, we looked at that, and we discovered that David said this several times in other psalms, too. We looked more particularly at Psalm 139, the last two or three verses. Remember, try me, O Lord, examine me, and know what is in my heart. And if there be any wicked way about me, remove it far from me. It's the way David spoke in Psalm 139, the latter verses. Again, what is teaching us is this. The believer understands that when he is brought into a relationship with Christ, the idea that we are living life apart from the eye of God, the presence of God, the perspective of God, the awareness of God is not something that the believer is to uh, take confidence in or to hold as a theological truth. We're not free from God's judgment. We're not free from his assessment. We're not free from his presence. God sees it all, doesn't he? He sees it all. And this is what we call in a more elaborate sense, uh, Coram Dale, to be in the presence of God. So if we're in the presence of God and God is judge and God judges the righteous and the wicked, then you and I can never ever perceive ourselves as to be able to hide from God or avoid God or deny God the right to call us on the carpet at any time. Uh, but rather, if we are maturing in Christ, what we want God to do is to affirm the relationship that we have with him on the grounds of him being our judge and our savior by actually bringing to light areas in our life that may not be pleasing in his sight, that may escape or um, avoid our detection. It is very possible, according to Jeremiah 17, 9, that my heart is so deceitful that I can think that I am doing the right thing and being right with God when in fact all I have done is basically deceive myself. But if God is going to be faithful in his relationship with me through Christ to conform me to his image, you know what he's not going to let me do? Walk in darkness. If God is going to conform me to the image of Christ, as we're learning in our John study, he is not going to allow me to walk in the darkness of my own deceptive mindset, is he? God is not going to allow me to drift into the dark, deceptive practices of hypocrisy that will threaten my walk with God and allow me to believe that I'm all right with God, even though I am behaving and conducting myself in a manner and in a fashion that does not glorify God. No, when, when God brings us into his presence, we are walking in the light. And therefore, in the light, we want to be comfortable enough to know that God not only is able to show us what's wrong, deal with what's wrong, but also correct us and bring us into a much more appropriate relationship with him. So examine me, prove me, try my heart and reins. And here's the confidence upon which he does that. For your loving kindness is before my eyes. Now notice he uses the term loving kindness. Now what did we learn last week that that loving kindness was personified? Christ. The loving kindness of God. That's the Hebrew word has said, as I shared with you last week. It's the covenant term that describes God's faithfulness, God's constancy, God's commitment to covenant with his people. In other words, what David is saying is, I am aware of, I am walking with a clear understanding as if I am in the presence of your very hesed. Your hesed is before my eyes. I am in the presence of your hesed, as the other Psalms uh, puts it as well. Not only does David say, I have set the Lord always before me, therefore I shall not be moved, Psalm 16. I have set the Lord always before me, therefore I shall not be moved. But another Psalm puts it like this. You have also set me in your presence, and because of that, I shall not be moved. Coram Dale. The hesed of God, the favor of God, the blessing of God, the loving kindness. Notice what he says, for your loving kindness is before my eyes. I want you to see a couple verses in the Psalms relative to that. Look at Psalm 51 verse 1 and notice how David uses it again. Now, if you know a little bit about the Psalms, here's what you know about Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is a penitential psalm. It's a psalm where David is crying out to God because David is in a really bad way this day. 
Some days we have good days, and at other times we have what? Bad days. Our life is not constant. That would be a delusion for us to even uh, assert that our life can be so constant that we kind of live on a constant, even keel without going through any real difficulties or changes. Depending on our level of maturity or not, our trials and our challenges are radical. Depending on our level of maturity, we can go from one day to the next through extreme changes of emotional and psychological and spiritual and practical difference. We can be very confident in the morning and very shaken up by the evening. We can be um, in a real sense of devotional thought and contemplation of God where there's a sense of God's nearness throughout the course of the day. By the time nighttime occurs, we can be as far from God emotionally and psychologically as anyone. These are the mutable conditions of humanity, even for the believer. So that you'll find David in the Psalms not only saying, judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness, your righteousness, and there's only one righteousness that God will judge his people by, and that is the righteousness of Christ, which assumes that David senses that he's in the presence of God. But there are times when David says, where are you, O Lord? Which means the distance between David has broadened so wide that David has no sense of the Coram Dale. And so at that point, what is David doing? Calling on God, which is another sign of maturity too, because if you know that you are drifting and it's really in the essence of your nature and desire to want to grow and mature in Christ, drifting is not the trajectory you want to be on. You don't want to drift. Drifting should alarm you. It should trouble you. It should plague you. And it should lead to an elicitation of your soul crying out to God, Lord, bring me back. Come get me. Help me. Where are you? I don't like this place of being all by myself. I will get in trouble over here, Lord, if you don't come get me. These are the broad spectrums of expressions that David renders in the Psalms, which makes us understand more fully what God meant when he said, this is a man after my own heart. At the end of the day, the most important thing to David was his walk with God. At the end of the day, above and beyond all of the important factors that he had to engage in as the king, more important than anything in the kingdom was his walk with God. But as I stated last week, the way we also want to capture this psalm is to understand that we have the privilege of watching and observing the life of a king. David's a king. And because he's a king, he's a leader. And because he's a leader, he's in a position where he is under constant surveillance of all horizontal Lilliputians. People on the horizontal level are watching David and they are judging David and they are despising David and they are condemning David or, and they are slandering David. All of this is richly poured out throughout the Psalms as well. David will lay out his argument to God that he wants God to judge him because he does not want to be given over to the judgments of men. You guys know the account where David inadvertently, out of a, a lack of wisdom, numbered the people in 1 Samuel chapter 21, 22, somewhere along those lines, and God came to him with three options of judgments, and the ultimate option that David took was for God to judge him. Do not leave me to the judgment of man, because man is merciless. So David even knew that when God was going to chastise him, that that chastisement wouldn't destroy David. This too gives us insight into David's knowledge of God and David's love of God as well. But notice how Psalm 51 verse 1 opens up. Have mercy on me, O God. Here it is. According to your what? Loving kindness. That's our same term. And here's how he explains that. According unto the what? Multitude of your tender mercies do what? Blot out my transgressions. Now, that's a commentary on Psalm 26, verses 1 through 4. Because what's taking place here in verse 1 of Psalms 51 is David's understanding of the process of God judging him. Here's David's understanding of the process of God's judging him. 
He understands that if he yields himself to the God who is the God of his salvation, he said that in Psalm 27, 1, here in Psalm 26, verse 1, he's saying, judge me, O God. In Psalm 27, 1, he says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? So what I'm saying to you is never hold in tension the idea that God judges his people from the notion that God is their salvation. He is both their judge and their savior. And these two realities are the way that God deals with us. Again, to sow this even deeper into you so that once we make our way through the text, we won't feel defrauded as we deal with the other six points. Is to understand this theme of God being the judge as something that runs through the whole of scripture. All of God's people are always under trial and under test. That's what we're saying. For God to judge me is for God to try me. For God to test me. The one reason that I believe that people don't like the Bible is because of that basic premise that the God of the Bible tries us and he tests us to prove to us who we are in relationship to him. The people who recognize that the Bible implicitly and explicitly teaches that God judges every man, tries the hearts of every man, exposes every man to his real nature and motive and the outcome and consequences thereof, do not like that kind of God. They don't want a God that tests them. Well, God tested Adam and Eve, didn't he? And then God tested the sons of Noah. And then God tested Abraham, didn't he? Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes. God tested David, didn't he? He tests men. Did God test his own son? Yes. All of his life was a test. So that's the whole point here is that um, when you come to know the true and the living God, you have to know that God now has cut the lights on. He's testing everything in your life. And it should move you to long to trust God that the outcome of the test will be God's vindication of you as a believer because your walk with God is one of faith, not works. When God tests us, when God tries us, when God deals with us, we have to have the same confidence, watch this now, that Job did as we closed out in our Bible study last week, Job 23 verse 10. Job says, I know that when God is through testing me, I will come forth as gold. Is that what it says? Yeah. I know that when God is through testing me, Job 23, 10, I will come forth as gold. Now, ladies and gentlemen, stay with me now. Think this through. I personally wouldn't want to go through what Job went through. But the only reason I'm saying that is because I actually don't have confidence in myself. But nor do I have the necessary confidence in God. Because if I really had confidence in God at that level, I could say, God tests me the same way you tested Job. Because I know that if Job in the middle of his test, this is Job 23.10, if the text is correct. We still have about 20 more chapters to go. Job is in the middle of the furnace, in the middle of the crucible. The heat is furious. And all of the impurities are flying out of Job's nature. He's saying things that you and I would be ashamed to say about God or to God or about ourselves. Job unhurled the whole gamut of, I don't know what's going on. I have not sinned. Show me my sin. If I've done something wrong, let me know. He lays out his own works, his own righteousness. He even exposes his brethren for not having the answer. Then he challenges God. God, where are you? Job is, he's getting at it. Uh, that's, that means you're really under test when you're talking like that. When your trials can move you to the extremity where you start talking to God in levels of urgency that are as candid as Job was, you're really under test. Most of us maintain these kind of deportments of, of, uh, of emotional temperament when we cry out to God that really kind of belies the fact that we're not really going through a whole lot. I mean, if you're saying in the midst of a trial, Lord, you know I'm really struggling. Would you help me through? You're not going through a whole lot. 
you're not going through much. I'm telling you now, you're not going through much. I think I shared with you a couple, two or three weeks ago about the true nature of the Abba Father expression. How many of you guys remember that? So 30, 40, 20% of you. And we, we take these biblical concepts and we really do codify them in a way that they actually lose their value because they end up becoming just fodder for what we call the language dynamic in the church. We love to just use Christian lingo in the church and not actually have a real understanding of the terms scripturally. Abba Father, Abba Father, Abba Father, we cry Abba Father, we cry Abba Father. When was the last time you really cried Abba Father? Really? When was the last time you cried Abba? Look, if you can't remember the last time you cried like that, it was not an Abba Father cry. Do you hear me? It was not an Abba Father cry. An Abba Father cry is the cry of a child desperately wanting the attention of his father. I mean, you can pray and you can talk to God and he hears us. God hears the voice of our supplication. He hears the, the voice of our weeping. It's not that we have to scream. It's just that in the economy of God, there are, there are going to be times where God is going to mandate that deep, guttural response of the soul that is a consequence of the spirits affirming your sonship at the level of you realizing there is no one else to turn to. And without that happening, you know, you, you can mark that test between a one and a 10. That's maybe a one or a two or a three. Until we're hitting eights and nines, eights and nines in our trials, eights and nines. We don't know anything about what Job went through. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Or what Joseph went through. Or what Hannah went through. The hell that sister went through as the second wife constantly berated by her adversaries which drove her to prayer such passionate prayer that Elkanah thought that she was drunk All right, so what we're dealing with as we're working through the Psalms in its introduction is understanding that David was a man whose knowledge of God was so profoundly deep and comprehensive that he was almost nose to nose with God that's uncomfortable for you and me. David is nose to nose. Here he is in Psalm 51 in the throes of about a year of having screwed up royally. You guys understand what I'm saying? So, you couldn't have told David two years before this that he was going to be sleeping with another man's wife. That he was going to kill that brother. And then take his wife and marry. You couldn't have told David that that was in the crevices of his heart. Now you see why by the time we get to Psalm 139, David is saying, clean me up, God, because if you don't clean me up, monsters will rise up out of my soul. You see it? All right. So what's interesting, what's interesting about the walk of the believer is that he or she does not know that the price that God paid to redeem your soul amounts to a price that is able to allow you the deep, most agonizing, troubling experiences of life, the most despairing, the most hazarding, the most problematic troubles of life that you could bring upon yourself, that you could bring upon yourself. The believer does not know that the purchase price of the blood of Christ anticipates the most gross rebellion on the part of the people of God that a human being could ever engage in. You understand what I'm saying? I'm saying that when we look at the cross, we must understand that the cross carries with it an eternal perspective and a comprehensive accomplishment in terms of being able to save to the uttermost those that are coming to God by faith. To the uttermost. And that the believer can collapse 
into heinous sin. Heinous, heinous, heinous sin so that the only one that can rightly judge it is the God that bore it in his behalf. The only one that can rightly judge that level of exigency, extremity, depth of depravity, departure from God, rebellion against God, that, that depth of disobedience. The only person that could judge that is the one who bore that for him. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? So, so when a believer finds himself off the map, the only map that he's off of is the map of human opinion. His own opinion or the opinion of men. Because he has now descended into such levels of darkness and the only thing that can deliver him is a God with whom both the light and the dark are exactly the same. You guys with me? How many of you don't understand what I'm saying? I do not want to speak in tongues. What I do want to share with you is we have to understand the radical nature of the cross. The radical nature of the cross and its intentionality to save sinners in the most desperate circumstance and that in our uh, interacting with God on a relational level that we don't want to so minimize the cross and so minimize the work of Christ and so minimize the love of God that we fail to understand that it's eternal significance, it's eternal enormity is there for me Whenever I fall, anywhere I fall, wherever, when, how, it doesn't matter. For those who are in Christ, the outcome of the process of God judging us is that he will have vindicated us. Do you guys follow that? This is the thing that, so what I'm trying not to do is rush through Psalm 26 by allowing you to miss David. Miss David. Don't miss David because if you miss David, you'll miss Christ. Don't miss David. David is the man who at this moment for you and I, he's already been laid out, filleted for us, not only in the scripture, but in history. And we all know David, don't we? And here David is the one that is candidly talking to God about having mercy on him according to his loving kindness, according to, and I've seen this for years, the multitude of your tender mercies, plural. Do you see what he's saying? There is a measureless extent to which your mercies are able to reach even the vilest sinner and blot out his transgressions so that at the end of the process, he's vindicated to have been the righteousness of God in Christ, no matter what he did. So there's a real sense in which what's going on with David is, is he's being radical about the gospel. Radical about the gospel. You guys got that? Radical about the gospel. Radical about Christ. Radical about the gospel. Radical about his need for the gospel. Radical about his appreciation of the gospel. Radical about the God of the gospel so that he's not playing the gospel down. See, it's possible to walk away from the gospel. And to walk away from Christ and to walk away from God when you don't know the gospel like this. It's possible to walk away from it because you don't know it. And this is the this here is the kind of uh, 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 parabolic uh, implication of Christ coming unto his own and his own receiving him not. Him being in the world and the world knowing him not. They are missing the mercy of God that is among them even now as we're going through the gospel of John. They're missing it, missing it, missing it. So much so that he came and went and even today, 2,000 years later, they still don't realize what they missed. And he told them, you guys have failed to understand the time of your visitation. You guys have failed to understand the enormity of the blessing that is before you in this context. So, he says, I... 
Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, that is your hesed, your covenant faithfulness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Then he goes into the sacerdotal, or what we call the priesthood language, which is in our text. So go back to Psalm 26, and let's work through this a little bit more. Since we already have a very clear picture that what David is wrestling with is the claims of the gospel that God has made known to him in Christ, for which he wants to cash in on the benefits because he does not want to neglect the blessings that come from knowing God in Christ, given the troubles that his life brings him. Did that make some sense? Given the trouble that his life brings him, what he's not going to do is neglect exhausting all the benefits of the gospel. That's a smart brother. Right. Given the fact that David now, he's probably about 45 Maybe 50. And it's around 45 or 50 that you begin to learn yourself. It takes a while to figure out who you are. It takes a minute. By the time you do, you're old. Okay? So it takes a while to figure out how self-deceptive you are, how personally manipulative you are, how you have deceived yourself, and how cunning you are over against your own best interests. It takes a long time to figure out you can't trust yourself takes a long time and some people never discover it. Some people never discover that the best thing that they can do is trust the Lord. Some people never discover it. But David is discovering it because David is in the school of Christ and in the school of Christ you're going to learn that you need him every hour. Every hour you need him. And that's really where David Begin to work through it according to our outline. I want to get into the next two points at least. In verse 1 through uh, 4, we read, 1 through 3, judge me, O Lord, that is vindicate me, for I've walked in my integrity. And we learn that walking in, in the integrity means to walk in the what? Spirit. To walk in the spirit. We talked about that, right? And I gave you uh, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 3, to underscore that the integrity of the upright shall guide them. And if you go through the Psalms, just the Psalms, use the Psalms as an exegetical text, David will talk about how God is the one that guides him. If he says, my integrity guides me, he really means God is his integrity. And we talked about integrity. It means to be consistent. It means to be innocent. It means to be whole. It means to be sincere. It means to know what you know and to know what you don't know. That's what integrity means. Integrity does not mean that you pretend to be something that you're not. Integrity simply says, this is who I am, this is what I know, and I don't know anything else. Now, you can be that way when you know that you don't have to know it all. All you have to know is that God knows it all. Now, if I know that God knows it all, I don't have to know it all. I don't have to perpetrate a fraud that I know everything since I know God knows everything. And if God knows everything and I'm God's, all I have to do is ask God. I don't have to pretend that I know. At that point, I'm usurping God's uh, authority and reputation as omniscient, right? Yes. So innocency is really critical. It is that childlike faith we talked about in prayer last night. Except you become like a little child and humble yourself, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is for those who know their limitations. All right? The kingdom of God is for those who know their limitations. So now watch this. Our second point goes like this. Having dealt with led by the spirit to see Christ, led by the spirit to see Christ, we move to the next uh, point. Graced to refrain from what? Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Notice what David says in Psalm 26, verses 4 and 5. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. Now, again, this is thematic in scripture. This is thematic. So the insight that you're about to uh, discover here has to do with the no factor that's given to every true believer who values God's approval over man's approval. Verses four and five have to do with the no factor that is given to every be believer who is committed to growth in Christ, who values Watch this now. God's favor over man's favor. Did that make sense? When you operate out of the biblical concept of the no factor, which is the way David opens up the Psalms. Blessed is the man that does not, that will not, that cannot 
walk, stand, sit in the council of the ungodly, seat of the scorner. He won't do it. He has a no factor in him. What is that no factor? That no factor is that he value God's approval more than man's approval. Got it? He values God's approval more than man's approval because once you are valuing man's approval, you will sit with the wicked. You will sit with the ungodly. You'll sit with the hypocrite. You'll sit with anybody that will give you what you want to get you where you want to go. You with me? David says, Lord, now you know I didn't sit with the highfalutin, upper echelon, sedity aristocrats in Israel. I did not sit with all of the wealthy, prominent men and women that hold positions of power and control in Israel. I didn't sit with them in order to get their favor or approval. I didn't sit with them. I didn't associate with them. I didn't sign contracts with them. I didn't worship with them. I didn't go to the kind of churches these folks go to who feel like they own the church because they paid for the church. Now, again, this speaks to the integrity factor of David's character as affirmed by God. Remember what God said? He's a man after my own heart. Isn't that what God said? Right. So right now, here's what you should be juggling. You should be juggling the common notion and views that we have about David that kind of just filter through the air of, you know, our social context in which we live. Where David is just a normal fella like you and I with all kind of normal troubles and struggles like you and I have. Over against the fact that now we're seeing that David has a secret. That David has a gift. He has a grace. That resides in him. That is so profoundly precious in the eyes of God. That it keeps David from making the critical mistakes that men make that lose out on God and on the blessings of God. In other words, what you and I want to be able to know is how is it that a man like David could stay in the favor of God with as much power and prominence and wealth that was disposed before him and all of the temptations that surrounded him that could have sunk any of us any time under most circumstances. How is it that that brother is able to say no. Well, it's because of verses 1, 2, and 3. He sees God has said. He sees God has said. You've got to be able to see Christ on a constant level. And Christ has to be the value system over against every other proposition and temptation and solicitous uh, invitation that might come your way. You have to actually be able to see the beauty and splendor and riches and wealth and prominence of Christ over against the temptation. And when you look at the temptation and you look at Christ, you go, that's not worthy of that. That is not worthy of that. I have set the Lord always before my faith, therefore I shall not be moved. That's Psalm 16. That's what I'm getting at. When we have a radically Christocentric affection for God so that the beauties of Christ are the things that motivate my value system, even though I'm going to be tested because I'm a fickle, complicated creature, the test won't succumb me so long as I and resolve to maintain a high value of Christ. Now, I need some other things to help facilitate that high value, don't I? I need some other things to help facilitate that high value because I can have an intellectual or perceptual view of Christ minus the content, minus the wealth, Minus the substance, minus the fullness, minus the efficacy. I can be intellectually aware of his person, but absent of the power of his person in my person. Amen. I can. So I need some help there. 
This is what David is dealing with. So he says, Lord, now you know I'm not coming to you as one of those other cats do, spending the preponderance of my time with the wicked, but now I got another issue I need to work out of which it requires you alone. So now I want to spend some time with you. No, I've been. And as a consequence, they've been putting contracts out on me as Psalm 2 all the way up to Psalm 26 underscores. David is constantly saying, God, deliver me from the wicked. Deliver me from my enemies. Deliver me from my foes. They encompass me about. They want to destroy me. Remember, he's a leader. And leaders are always subject to being taken out by people who are covetous and driven to want the position. You guys got that? And remember, I told you in the background of David is that not only could David uh, clearly see that the people who sat at the table with him were not for him, but his own family was not for him. So that he found little comfort in his mama and his daddy or his brothers or his sisters. The only place that David could go was to God. This is what makes David such a pristine type of who? Christ. Christ. So David is constantly appealing to God, saying, God, now you know you got me in this position of prominence and power and, and, uh, and, and visible stature, and people are flocking to me, as I stated in our previous message in John chapter 9, as the night flies, remember? The night flies, remember that? The night flies. They come because of the light. David's got all these flies around him, and they want to kill him. David said, Lord, you know I didn't sit with them. Jeremiah chapter 15 verse 16 I'll just use one but there's many Jeremiah 15 16 this is the way Jeremiah put it when the same test came on Jeremiah listen to what Jeremiah chapter 15 start uh, back at verse 15 for me and I want to go through 17 Jeremiah 15 15 oh Lord you know remember me and visit me and revenge me of my what this is the same context. Take me not away in your long suffering. Take me not away in your long suffering. You notice that what Jeremiah is doing is what David is doing, which is what we all should do. In the midst of our appeal to God to deal with our adversaries, keep me from going astray. See the line there? Take me not away in your long suffering. Take me not away in your long suffering. That's really, Lord, in the midst of the way you act. Because the way God acts, ladies and gentlemen, is that God is extremely long-suffering. And the long-suffering of God is a real stumbling block for the wicked. But it can be a test for the righteous as well. Because the righteous... When you and I are not constantly rooted in a reminder of what the Bible says about the character and nature of God, relative to God's providence, you and I can temporarily lapse into a notion that God is being slack and that God is showing favor to the wicked and that God is blessing those who have not com committed covenant to, to God and, and follow God and somehow if I just kind of edge my way over into the sphere of these folks who appear to be blessed on a superficial level, I'll get some of that. That can be a test for a believer. True? Yeah. That can be a real test for a believer. Yes. In other words, what can test the believer is God's long suffering. When the believer fails to re realize and remember that the long suffering of the Lord is all about salvation. Amen. That's all it's Overlooking sin, uh, disregarding justice, a person's abrogating punishment and discipline will, were necessary, the long-suffering of the Lord should never be viewed on our part as if God has now lapsed in his character. It should never be viewed like that. Once we're doing that, we are making God a man that he should lie and the son of man that he should repent. And God is neither one, is he? Right. So you and I want to be able to remember that in the midst of the mystery of God's long-suffering, long-suffering, the word means slow to wrath. But wrath nonetheless. His wrath is increasing against the day of judgment and indignation of men. Men are heaping up to themselves, treasuring up the wrath of God against themselves daily. 
And God is long-suffering, allowing that to happen because while they are doing that, God is saving his people. That's what he's doing. Every day the sun rises up, you know what the sun is saying to you and I? The Lord's saving somebody today. Because if he weren't, he would shut this thing down and bring the final judgment and recreate a new heavens and a new earth and we would move on with the business of the final accomplishments of Christ on the cross. But because God allows the sun to rise again, he's saying, I'm showing mercy. And this is what David knows in Psalm 51. God, in the multitude of his tender mercies, allows his wretched child to wake up another day after yesterday messing up so bad. So bad. That today is another day. And you get to jump with David in Psalm 118 and go, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it because his mercies are renewed every day. God is saying yes in his mercies to me. God is saying yes in his mercies to me, right? He's saying yes in his mercies to me. He's not saying no, he's saying yes. And the son is proving that. It rose again. He's saying yes in his mercies. Grace to refrain, refrain from hypocrisy. Listen to the way Jeremiah puts it. Oh Lord, you know, remember and visit me. Revenge me of my persecutors. Take me not away in your long suffering. Know that for your sake I have suffered rebuke. Like, like Jeremiah had to remind God. But I even love that because when you pay careful attention to the authors of scripture, the level of sincerity and candidness with which they talk with God is appealing. You and I on a theological level know that God is omniscient, so we're never ever telling God anything he doesn't know. But we will let that mess up our relationship with God uh, at times because you and I don't have the ability to talk in omniscient terms. We can only really talk in the terms of what we call the limited time-space continuum. We can only talk in terms of the here and now. We can only talk in terms of the immediacy of experiences that take place now so that right now, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Though theologically, I know this, that before the world began, Christ died for all my sins. And in the mind of an omniscient God, they had all together been put into the sea of forgetfulness even before he created the universe. So that by the time he came to me in the gospel and saved me, he only saved me in the sense of revealing to me his salvation. He had already accomplished it 2,000 years ago. And he had already purposed it infallibly before the world began. So that for God, it was a done deal. But in relational terms, God expects me, whenever I mess up, to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And in relational terms, God expects me to look for and wait for that sense of forgiveness that comes through the third person, which says yes to me when I have confessed my sins and acknowledged my rebellion against God. Conflating eternity with time. Does that make sense? Conflating eternity with time. I'm not going to get on the same level with God and talk to him from a perspective of eternality. Say, now God, now I know you've forgiven me of all my sins. To hell I go. You got that? To hell I go. So listen to this. David, uh, Jeremiah says in verse 16, these words. Your words were found and I did eat them and they were the what? Joy and rejoicing of my heart. So now David is bringing in, uh, uh, Jeremiah is bringing in that fundamental instrument, in instrumental means or that effective means by which you and I sustain a relationship with God. This is a foregone conclusion. You and I cannot have the kind of vital walk with God that David does or Jeremiah does without God's word. Neglect God's word and you are adrift on a sea of topsy-turvy unknowingness without any confidence that God will tow you back in. Neglect God's word and you won't have this kind of boldness to talk to God the way Jeremiah did. Jeremiah in verse 15 says, Lord, you know I suffered for your name's sake. That's bold. Is that bold? Right, because again, we're often questioning our own motives, are we not? But if God gives you enough light to know your motive, you don't have to question it. 
This is the way the Psalms work. This is what we're dealing with in our Friday study in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is uh, giving us kind of an a autobiography, a, uh, a, 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 a prayer book um, of, of his life. And in his prayer book, every now and then he just starts and starts talking to God. You know, without even warning us that he's talking to God. Yeah, and Sam Ballard did this and Tobiah did that. And I, and I caught all of those young men. Oh, God, remember me in your mercy. When you punish the wicked, remember what I did for you. Uh, that's called a journal. We were talking about that last night. You know how you have journals? So Nehemiah is writing about all this wicked stuff. And then he thinks about God. And he starts talking to God. All those gives you insight as to real authentic relationships that people have with God. Don't they? They show you how these people really view God as a person and talked to God that way. You got that? He, he's, he's writing about all the stuff, that, and then he just goes into, God, remember all that I've done. What does that mean? He has a very conscious awareness of the presence of God and that when he talks to God, God is listening to him. Actually, that's the beauty of the Psalms. That's why you want to learn it. Because we want the Psalms to incarnate themselves in us. We want to be able to find ourselves talking to God like we just are talking to a person. Just start talking. And then not wondering in your head, is God hearing me? Or is God present? Or did I frame my theology right? No. Just talk to him. And from a place of faith, know, know that he's hearing. Right? Right, because that's what David is doing. So listen to what he says. Your words were found, I did eat them, and they were the joy and rejoicing in my heart, for I am called by your name. Now what is he doing? He's affirming his identity as a child of God, right? I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. That's what he's doing. He's reminding himself as he talks to God that he's a child of God. What that means is that he has a right to talk to God and he has a right for God to hear him. That's good. Verse 17. I did not sit in the assembly of mockers, nor rejoiced. I sat alone because of your hand. Ugh. Do you notice what he said? You graced me not to sit with the wicked. You graced me not to capitulate to bribes. You graced me to demonstrate a no factor that set me out over against them that really increased their hatred towards me, but you graced me anyway. You gave me grace to stay in my place. You gave me grace not to slip over into a world of hypocrisy. You graced me, oh God. So he's acknowledging that, is he not? He's acknowledging that God has kept him. For you have filled me with indignation. Oh, that's another one. That's going back to Psalm 26. Doesn't Jeremiah sound like David now? You have filled me with indignation. What did David say? I hate the congregation of the wicked. Going back to Psalm 26. Let me redeem that real quick. Just in case some of our brothers and sisters either here or who are watching might want to take that up and go burn down some church buildings. Um, we don't want you doing that. Uh, be very careful to understand the uh, biblical concept of hatred redemptively. Be very careful to understand the biblical concept of hatred redemptively. I'm Psalm 26, got a few more minutes. Psalm 26, verse 5. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. Do you guys see that? Yeah. So in your own time, just meditate on Jeremiah 15, 16, and 17 relative to this. Because what Jeremiah simply said is this. Your word has worked so effectually in my heart to give me the kind of affection and love for your truth that I discover that I abhor ungodliness. I discover that I abhor that which is not right. I discover that I detest and distance myself from that which is not pleasing to you. Did you see how I framed that? Yeah. Did you see how I framed that? In other words, David, uh, David or Jeremiah's removal from or sustaining against the pull and tug of the popularity of the culture 
was not simply some intrinsic, selfish, sort of nasty vitriol against his fellow man out of anger or maybe some kind of deficit in their own character, some kind of psychological, emotional turmoil that they went through when they're growing up. You know, kids, if they don't get dealt with early on, create a monster in themselves called anger and hatred, right? And it's not rooted in self-righteousness. And so, yeah, they can hate people. That's not what God is talking about. What God is talking about is hating evil. Hating evil at a level of not affording yourself to be entertained by them or controlled by them. And thus, on a practical level, you're going to not associate yourself with those who love evil. Right? It's just, you graced me, watch this, you graced me to love what you love and hate what you hate. You graced me to stay in my lane and you graced me to grow ever longing to be more like Christ, therefore despising the shameful things of the wicked. You graced me, what Jeremiah said. That's actually what David is saying. That's what David is saying. Can I deal with two more verses and shut it down? Listen to this. Listen to Psalm 26. Verse 6 and 7 and 8. And then we'll come back and close it out. So now David turns the corner and he begins to do something in terms of his reflection and his request to God to vindicate him on the grounds of his walking in the spirit, on the grounds of him trusting in Christ, on the grounds of having Christ in his presence, on the grounds of that impact giving him a no factor that doesn't allow him to dwell with or com uh, congregate with or um, associate with the ungodly. He says, my practice will be, according to verse 6, I will wash my hands in what? Innocency. So will I compass thine what? O oh, Lord. Listen to what David says. This here is in point number three. This is number three in your outline. The clean heart will do what? Exalt God. The clean heart will do what? Exalt, exalt God. God. The clean heart will exalt God. It will exalt God. And it will exalt God on these three levels. Here, here is the blessing of a gospel church that so sets forth the atonement and the work of Christ so near to the soul, so near to the soul, that the redeemed sinner will avail himself to the atoning work of Christ on such a consistent level that he will be honest with God in order to benefit from the atoning work of Christ. You see when the phrase uses the term, I will wash my hands in innocency? Do you see that? Yes. I will wash my hands in innocency? In verse 6, it says, I will wash my hands in innocency. What David is describing is what a man does when he resolves to have a right relationship with God, abandoning everything else. I will wash my hands in innocency. This is what Pilate did when he was done with Jesus. And what David is saying is, I'm done with the wicked. I'm done with the ungodly. I'm done with this world. I wash my hands in innocency and I'm cleaving to your altar. Now this is a paradoxical statement. This is a paradoxical statement because I will wash my hands in innocency does not mean that I will wash my hands in sinlessness. It simply means I will wash my hands in the earnest and honest opinion that your word has rendered concerning who I am. Who I am is a sinner saved by your grace. And I'm clear about that. I'm clear about who I am before you. I will wash my hands in innocency. In other words, I'm not going to lie about your clear uh, testimony of scripture concerning who I am by nature. I know what I am by nature. I'm what by nature? Why? So that this is what James meant in James chapter 4 about 100 years ago when we were there. Remember what James said? And around verse 6, wash your hands, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and be no more double-minded. Remember that? What James was saying is you profess to be believers, just keep it real with God. So when you're washing your hands as the priests are doing, you're saying that you need God's washing. You're saying that you're committed to approaching God. Because that's what the priest did. 
They were washing hands and washing feet as they approached God. They were washing hands and washing feet as they approached God. As they are approaching God, they are rejecting the world. As they are rejecting the world, they are affirming the beauty and importance of God. They are washing their hands of the world. That is to say, good riddance with the world. That's what David was saying. I will wash my hands in innocence. You're not going to have an adulterer, spiritual adulterer with me, God. I'm not going to have dirty hands approaching God. I'm going to wash my hands. I'm going to tell the truth. Why? Because I want the benefits that your altar brings me. You guys see that? So now what is this whole thing of the altar? If we were to quickly transfer the altar into the New Testament, what are we talking about? The cross. The cross. You got it? What is the sacrifice that God offers in order for men and women to approach God but the cross of Christ? Do you see the parallel? He washes his hands in innocency, but he cleaves to the cross as the grounds of his acceptance. Do you see it? And notice what he says. I will compass your altar, O Lord. I will compass your altar. You know what he's saying? Anytime you look at your altar, guess who you're going to see there? This is where I'm making my home. I'm going to encompass your altar. I'm going to encircle your altar. I'm going to walk about your altar. I'm going to live near your altar. I'm going to dwell near your altar. Your altar is going to be the central point of my communion with you. Your altar. The word there, that little phrase there, so will I compass, our compass, is the phraseology that's used in the psalmist where David is pleading with God concerning his enemies. Lord, my enemies compass me about. They are so interested in my destruction that every time I look up, they're in my face. Well, what David is saying is, I am so interested in your mercy and in your salvation, which is in Christ. Every time you look up, I'm at the cross. Every time you look up, I'm at your altar. Every time you look up, I'm trusting in the merits of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as my acceptance before you. See, David is serious about God's approval in his life. He's serious about God's approval in his life. You guys got that? He's serious about God's approval in his life. There are many other implications here too, which is crazy. On a Levitical level, the priest would be saying, David, uh-uh, you can't do that. That's just for the priest. You can't do that, David. David is saying, I am a priest. I live in the New Testament, even though I dwell in the old. Powerful. So in his heart, he knew that the true Jerusalem was above. He knew that the true altar was Christ. And he knew that the true Israel were all of God's elect from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. He knew that the true priesthood was every believer in Christ. He knew that the true high priest was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He knew that he was not impeded from coming to God as that earthly temple impeded everyone from coming to God but the priest. He came to God in spite of that Old Testament temple. This is why he could say sacrifices and offerings you do not desire. It's a broken and a contrite heart that you want, oh God, that will access anyone into your presence on the grounds of who Jesus is. You see how radically gospel-centered David is? You see how tenacious he is about his standing before God? So here's what he's doing. Here's what he's doing. I'm going to close it here. Here's what he's doing. He's saying, God, judge me, and judgment is a process. Judge me, and when you're done judging me, vindicate me. And here's my confidence that you will vindicate me because my only grounds of confidence with you is what your son has done for me on the cross. My only grounds of confidence with you is what your son has done for me on the cross. See it? See it? And the rest of the psalm is very explanatory, self-explanatory. Here it is. I'll wash my hands in innocency. So will I accomplish your altar, O Lord, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all your wondrous works. See verse 7? Yes. You know what verse 7 is? It's public worship because of private communion. 
The efficacy of the atonement that David is deriving from his nearness to the cross of Christ allows him to shout with all the saints about the goodness and mercy of God as he's thanking God, thanking God, thanking God, thanking God for being the kind of savior that he is. I will publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all your wondrous works. This is an implication on preaching as well. I will preach with the voice of thanksgiving from a place of utter gratefulness and I will tell of all your wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of your what? Now you're talking about the blessing of being part of a gospel church. See, he's coming up out of the centrality of a close, exclusive walk with God backing up and demonstrating that the context or site upon which that blessing occurs is in a gospel church. The nearness and, and closeness is between David and his God. His God is judge, but his judge is also his savior, right? That's the holy of holies. That's the Shekinah glory sitting on the Ark of the Covenant where propitiation takes place by the judge of all the earth. So my judge is my savior. My savior is the one who shed his blood for me. I am near to God, but I'm only near to God because of the gospel church. I'm only near to God because I'm in a place where God inhabits the presence of his people because of the person and work of Jesus Christ. I'm in a place of enjoying God because the gospel has so thoroughly impacted my life with clarity in terms of the person and work of Christ that I can be this kind of bold with God, this kind of bold with God. This kind of bold with God. Is he bold? Listen, what David is doing is that which only the high priest really can do. Draw that near to God. But isn't it true, child of God, in the person of Christ, we are as near to God as we can ever be. Yes. Nearer to God we cannot be as near to God as we are when we're in his son, Jesus Christ. Nearer to God we cannot be than when we are in Christ. Because when we're in Christ, we're in the high priest. And when we're in the high priest, we're in God. And this is how David is overcoming all of the challenges in his life. Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house, the place where your honor dwelleth. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, in whose hands is mischief and their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be merciful unto me. My foot stands in an even place. Didn't we learn? That was table land. In the congregation, I will what? Bless the Lord. So now what is David really appealing for? What is he appealing to God for? David's request has both a confidence behind it with an expected outcome. What is, God's, what is David's confidence? It's faith. Faith. Without faith, it's impossible to what? Please, God. That's David's confidence. So do you hear faith just drenched all through the song? Faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. What is his, out what is his expected outcome? His expected outcome is actually the theme of our study. And it's one word. David wants to be blessed. Got it? David wants to be blessed. Do you? See, David is radically pursuing the blessing. He's pursuing the blessing. So in our previous outline, we talked about the seven aspects of it, the meaning of it, the source of it, the grounds, object, evidence, obligation, impact of it. David wants to be blessed. That's what David is recognizing is in his pursuing God at the level that he's pursuing God, watch this, one day, one day, all of this that God is calling us to in pursuing him, will ultimately amount to us seeing him face to face. And that's really the ultimate blessing. I think it's one psalm, I'm going to close with one psalm uh, that underscores this back in Psalm 17. I'm in Psalm 17. Uh, last, last three verses. Arise, O Lord, Disappoint him, cast him down, deliver my soul from the wicked, which is your sword, for men which are thy hand, O Lord, for men of the world, which have their portion in this life, whose bellies you fill with your hid treasures. They are full of children. They leave the rest of their substance to their babes. As for me, here it is again. You see? Here's David's ultimate objective. As for me, I will behold your face in what? 
Is David still talking about the face of God? He says, as for me, my desire is to behold your face in righteousness. I will only be satisfied when I wake with your likeness. That's it. Does he understand the gospel? Does he understand that predestination and election and being called and chosen and being sanctified and quickened and being glorified means that one day this God that we talk to by faith, we will talk to by sight. Does he get that? Do you see then the singularity of David's life, the singularity? Do you see the secret of the believer here? Staying fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stand for prayer. Staying fixed on Christ. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your servant, David. Thank you for your spirit giving us access into the radical nature of his commitment towards you. Thank you for showing us how that by looking to you, appealing to you, calling upon you to work out, uh, work in us, work within us, the will and to do of your good pleasure will lead to a more radical commitment to you, a greater confidence in you, uh, greater clarity of you. And then one day, a full orbed, visible manifestation of you as you transform us into your image as well. Uh, the practical lessons in our study help us to get it. Help us to get it, oh God, help us to understand what it means to be blessed and therefore to be a blessing. As we go our way, give us traveling mercies, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Amen.